Hello, I'm Jean Setzfun, Senior Vice President of Programs at AARP. I'm pleased to be here to welcome you to the second day of the Fast Forward Summit entitled Food Court. Today, you'll hear from speakers about their vision of and views on the future of food. And while the theme of this summit is forward looking, the topic of food is also very current, particularly that of food insecurity. Before the coronavirus pandemic, according to Feeding America, there were 37.2 million people who did not have access to nutritious food to live a healthy life. With the onset of corona, uh, coronavirus, there are now an additional 17 million people experiencing food insecurity in 2020. That's over, 50, that's over 54 million individuals, almost the entire population of England, who is at risk of hunger. As you'll hear later today, this affects young children, grown adults, and people over the age of 50. This has been an issue, this is an issue today, and will be an issue moving forward. Food shortages caused by the pandemic have carried serious implications for older adults, as access to meals at local senior centers and other places have been limited due to the need for social distancing measures. This is a national issue, but we've seen time and time again Local leaders, businesses, nonprofits, and committed residents step up to respond. For example, retailers are helping expand the federal government's Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, otherwise known as SNAP, by accepting electronic benefit transfer payments for home delivery of groceries in some markets. And if you tuned in yesterday, you heard AARP's Nancy Lamont discuss AARP's work in community on an effort that we call Livable Communities where we partner with leaders and residents to help towns, cities, and rural areas become great places for people of all ages and abilities. Through this effort, AARP has ties to roughly 700 communities that are part of our network of age-friendly states and communities or have received a grant through AARP's Community Challenge Grant Program. We saw communities in our network respond immediately to a range of COVID-19 issues and the food and security challenge was quickly identified as a top need. This year, AARP also granted 2.4 million to 184 organizations through our Community Challenge Grant Program, which included 25 grants specifically dedicated to coronavirus response and recovery. For example, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the Indian Nation, uh, Nation's Council of Governments is implementing a free food delivery service pilot that will make use of a bike share program to deliver grocery orders to home, homebound residents. And later on in today's program, you'll see a video of another AARP Community Challenge grant in Oklahoma that helped the tribal community provide healthy food to residents. Looking forward, it will take new innovations, incremental and bold actions to meet the moment and create a food forward future that serves the needs of all residents in our communities. To learn more about AARP's work in communities and to access our free resources, including AARP's Community Challenge Grant Program, please visit our website, www.aarp.org backslash livable. Also to help, uh, to help address senior hunger, on September 11th of this year, the AARP Foundation launched a Celebration of Service Meal Pack Challenge, which has the goal of sending 25,000 boxes of non-perishable food to the Capital Area Food Bank in Washington, DC. If you'd like to participate, you can visit mealpackchallenge.org to request a box, prepaid shipping label, and detailed instructions. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the rest of today's discussion. Hi, my name is Sanjeev Krishnan. I'm with SGG Ventures. We invest in entrepreneurs and innovation that make the U.S. food system more sustainable and more healthy. And I'm delighted uh, to be invited today and speak with you all about our vision, sort of the future of the food system. Um, I think one of the things that we did post um, COVID was really right around April or May, really in the fog of the lockdowns, was really look at well, how the food system was going to be impacted uh, by COVID. At the time, there was a lot of anxiety. There continues to be anxiety today 
um, around what was going to be the impact of this from um, on our economy, on our food system, um, and our broader culture. And at the time people were talking about 08, 09, and the financial crisis, 9 11, World War II, and none of that, none of those mental models really fit with us. And so we looked at um, pandemic history, pandemic economic history, the innovation that comes out of pandemics, and the impact that it had on the food system. So that's what we're going to spend the next sort of eight to, to 10 minutes talking about with you today. Um, really, you know, we, we published a, a white paper on our website, um, but the, 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 the content of the next eight to 10 minutes are really threefold. One is sort of pandemics 101. It's oddly an optimistic story around a uh, history of recovery and innovation. Um, second is sort of, you know, the way this crisis becomes a catastrophe is our food system breaks down globally. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about sort of how the food system has been reacting since COVID. And then finally, the future of food, how I think we think how COVID-19 and calories, how, how does, how does the, um, the crisis impact the future of food? Um, and so pandemic history, one, we looked at sort of from the Justinian plague uh, to, to, to the, the Black Death, to the Spanish flu, and then some of the modern pandemics that, that occur. Um, all of them vary in terms of mortality rates, duration, and, and their length, but ultimately all come to an end. What happens is often almost with every pandemic that we studied um, since the Justinian plague, there is an innovation cycle that follows. Modern medicine really came out of the Spanish flu pandemic. Um, there are new innovations that, that, that get spurred, new sectors that get invented, uh, and innovations that, 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 that get accelerated. Already, we've seen the growth of telemedicine. Cleveland Clinic, I think, went from five percent telemedicine to now majority. Um, teleeducation, you know, we Harvard went from zero teleeducation or very little to now, um, in many cases, full. And so, you've seen institutions really accelerate behavior change and innovation as a result of this. And we think that's is happening more broadly in an economy. In in terms of the food system, um, we have seen how resilient the food system has become, um, but there has been a huge bifurcation. So you've seen grocery uh, retail really accelerate <clears throat> and, and food service really decline. And some of that food service has come back, but but um, grocery continues to enjoy strong growth uh, from at-home eating perspective. Um, operational uh, delivery, operational pressures on food delivery continues. Oddly, we were just talking to a large investor that actually has seen data where um, citizens over 50 actually have accelerated e-grocery and have actually um, continued that behavior and not gone to brick and mortar. Um, and in, in, in fact, some of that um, channel digitalization, if you will, has impacted new demand signals, particularly around healthier eating um, for, that, for that demographic. Um, in, in addition, we... Prior to the crisis, we saw a lot of at, away from home eating that is now at home. So you're seeing kind of, you know, both during the lockdown and then post lockdown, significant changes to consumer behavior, which ultimately drive, you know, the food system long term. Um, the other trends we're seeing is, is private label continue to gain share. Um, it was already a, a trend with grocery, U.S. grocery, sort of European grocery versus U.S. grocery. U.S. is Europe is usually double private label. Um, and so you're seeing that um, increase in the in the U.S. Consumer staples are, are, are doing well. The center of the perimeter of the store continues to grow, but the center store grew as well. And the other thing that we see is is a desire for value focused uh, as well. Particularly, I think as the crisis continues and unfolds into next year, um, income inequities will will start to have an impact. We think around food system um, and then particularly around consumer behavior. There's the, the crisis also brought a lot of attention to the fragility of our system, um, particularly kind of our notion of centralized food. You know, we had a, we did we had a just in time food system globally, but we didn't have a just in case food system. And so things like uh, logistics, labor, um, and and also around food nationalism um, popped up really in, in May or June. Some of that continues because um, obviously you know a lot of um, governments globally are focused on their own domestic populations as they should be. And so food security uh, continues and, and food self-reliance is a key theme that continues today. 
and, and we're seeing that in our work as investors across the food system. So the future of food, um, we think it, it's really how do you build a resilient um, food system? And we think some of these things, four things are interesting to us. Having a distributed modular system, we think gives you a competitive advantage. Embracing complexity, the food system is incredibly complex. And so rather than try to simplify it, we, we think, you know, a lot of the technology is just to embrace it and actually take advantage of it. Um, how do you get more agility and speed in our food system? And then, you know, talking about income inequity and access to healthy food that's also cheap and affordable, how do we create more deflationary platforms as opposed to what we have today, which is really two food systems, one for, for the worried well, if you will, and then one for everybody else. And so similar, we want to build that bridge through, and we think innovation, entrepreneurship, and risk capital really does that. Um, some of the trends that we saw in terms of the future food system are accelerating as a result of COVID. So the protein sector and, and, the, and plant protein has increased significantly in terms of demand. Um, indoor agriculture, sort of vertical and greenhouse farming continue to accelerate in our view. The digitalization of agriculture, agriculture is going, we think from data poor to less data poor with a lot more remote sensing and other IOT and, and, and digitalization that's getting deployed on farm. We think that's gonna have implications broader than the farm gate. Um, and online grocery delivery, it, it continues to, to increase at a non-linear rate. And then finally, something we're very passionate about is the convergence of, of food and medicine um, and, and nutrition sort of as and disease more interlinked. Um, we think about some of the catalysts of COVID, um, which is really around fragility, behavior change, the nature relation with interdependency and the future of globalization, as well as data failure. And we think about four themes that we think are potential ways that, that shape the future food system. One is digitalization. Two is decentralized food systems, um, both regional and local. Um, and, and then third is decommodification with deflation. So you've had the last 20 years, the growth of the Chinese protein demand, ethanol in the U.S. Some of those trends are, are, are kind of flatlining in terms of growth. And we think um, there's there's opportunities to create more biodiversity and more profit for the farmer and more a better consumer experience as well. And then finally, sort of food is immunity. I think two years from now or three years from now, when you look at the core morbidity rates of COVID-19, we think a huge uh, linkage back will be our food system um, and what, how does that contribute it. And so these are the four things we think about that will shape the future of food. Um, and I'm so thankful to be invited and, and give my presentation today. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Gabrielle Weimer, one of the co-founders of Meal Flower, and it's my pleasure to be here with all of you today to talk about how edible insects can help improve food security. So as we've already touched upon today, food insecurity isn't just a challenge. In the US, 25% of the world's population is currently moderately or severely food insecure. And by looking at this map, we can see that a lot of that food insecurity is concentrated in low resource countries and countries that are going to be increasingly impacted by the effects of climate change. And this isn't just a problem today. This is going to be a problem that we need to continue to wrestle with in the coming years. By 2050, the global population is projected to reach 9 billion people. And that means that we're going to need to produce twice as much food and twice as much meat in order to meet the food demands of this growing population. At the same time, the global population is growing and the demand for food is increasing. We're also going to see the increasing negative effects of climate change. So extreme weather events like hurricanes and typhoons, along with droughts and fires, are going to negatively impact the agriculture and food production systems. And this is all going to lead to increasing food insecurity. So we need to identify the future of food. And the reason I'm here today is to talk about how edible insects fit into that. The catalyst for this conversation was really a 2013 report by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN. And they really laid out how edible insects can be the future prospects for food and feed security. In the years since then, we've seen several publications from the BBC to the Washington Post 
to independent bloggers and even academic articles like this one from Indiana University a month ago that said that insects show promise as a good and sustainable food source. Now, I'm sure many of you watching might be a bit perplexed. Edible insects are not as common in North America, but the truth is 80% of the world already eats insects. There are countries in every continent where this is already a part of the diet. You can find crickets and grasshoppers in Mexico to silkworms in markets in Thailand. And not only do they taste good, but they also have a lot of other benefits. So the first, of course, is the nutritional benefits. Edible insects have just as much or more protein than traditional livestock, like beef or chicken. They also require a lot less water. So as we were talking about, with the increasing impacts of climate change and increasing droughts, we're really going to need to identify less water-intensive foods that can meet people's nutritional needs. And edible insects definitely fulfill that. Producing one pound of meat requires 2,000 gallons of water, whereas one pound of edible insects requires less than a gallon of water. And they're also much better for the environment in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So edible insects the, produce negligible amounts of greenhouse gases, which are the driver of climate change. Livestock, on the other hand, contributes 12 times as many greenhouse gases. And so edible insects can really be part of a sustainable and environmentally friendly food system. And there already are a lot of organizations and groups pushing this forward. We have companies like Entomo Farms, Aspire Food Group, and Kreka that are commercially producing insects and selling directly to consumers. And they're also making insect powders that can be incorporated into other food products. So maybe that's how some of you have tried insects before and insect protein bars or cricket chips. We also have companies like Live In Farms in Europe that produce tabletop farms that are, automate the insect farming process so that people can have them in their homes. And probably to many, to interest of many of you in the audience is the North American Coalition for Insect Agriculture. And this group is really driving forward the research and the advocacy in North America to make edible insects more acceptable and to also push the research around it so that we have the legislation in place and can make it accessible both for human consumption and for feed, since that's another area where edible insects have a lot of potential. But I'm here today to talk specifically about Mealflower, the organization that I co-founded with Elizabeth Frank and Joyce Liu. And before I tell you more about our work in Guatemala, I want to take a moment to hear from one of our program participants, Doña Irma. I couldn't agree more with Doña Irma. Thinking about the future and children's health is what really pushed us to start Meal Flower. Malnutrition is a huge problem in Guatemala. It has the sixth highest rate of chronic malnutrition in the world. And this problem is especially bad in indigenous communities where 70% of children are malnourished. And so when we were trying to think of a way to address this, we looked at what other organizations already were doing. And we saw that a lot of them were providing protein supplements. But this creates a dependence on aid and doesn't empower communities to take control of their nutrition. So we didn't think that this was a good model. It also contributes to waste. So having to package all of those protein powders and protein paste and then transporting them into communities both in urban and rural areas is not environmentally sustainable. The last program that we looked at were traditional livestock programs. So we had researched and learned about programs raising chickens and guinea pigs in Latin America, but those can often be too expensive and out of reach for communities that are food insecure and suffering from malnutrition. And as we discussed earlier, that's also not environmentally sustainable. 
So that's when we started trying to think about what could be an environmentally sustainable solution. And this is really critical in Guatemala because it's part of the dry corridor in Central America. And this is a geographic region that's been severely impacted by droughts. And in Guatemala, the population that's impacted by the dry corridor is 1.7 million people. And it's devastated agriculture there. And so we really needed to find a solution that wouldn't require a lot of water. And that could work in these different contexts in Guatemala. And that's how we came up with mealflower and realized that edible insects really do have the potential to meet the needs of these food insecure and malnourished communities. And our goal at mealflower is to empower communities to produce edible insects at home so that families can produce their own protein at home. So what we do is partner with local organizations and move communities through our training program. So we start by collecting recyclables or identifying readily available plastic containers. And then we teach people how to build mealworm farms. And what you see on the screen is exactly what a mealworm farm looks like. It's several layers of plastic bins that separate the different life stages of the mealworm, um, which is actually the larval stage of the darkling beetle. And so the darkling beetle goes in the top bin, which has some holes to allow the eggs to pass through. And then the eggs will hatch and the mealworms, as they grow, you separate them by size until they reach two centimeters in length. And at that point, they're ready to be harvested. And so harvesting just means taking the mealworms out, washing and roasting them, and then you can turn them into this protein-rich powder. And that's really critical because as Doña Irma said, in, in some communities, there isn't a tradition of eating edible insects. It kind of depends on the region of Guatemala. Um, but by turning it into a powder, we're really able to increase the accessibility so that people can put it into the foods they're already making. The other benefit of mealworm farms is that the frass or mealworm waste product is a great fertilizer because it's really rich in nitrogen. And so that means that these families a lot of times who already have at family gardens, community gardens, can use this frass to help them grow fruits and vegetables. So we do all of this through a training program in partnership with local community organizations. And we go through all of these different classes in the program. So we always start off with an introduction to mealworms and the importance of protein. And of course, we always bring along samples. So we make some mealworm cookies or other things that the women can try. So they really can get a taste of the program, both literally and metaphorically. And once we explain the benefits of it and why protein is so important, we see lots of excitement and interest in joining the program. And that's really important to us because this is really participatory. After we get women to sign up for the program, we go through a couple of other classes. So we talk about how to build and set up the mealworm farm, how to maintain it. And this part is really critical because we use what's called a train the trainer model. And so we're training community leaders so that they eventually can go on and train other members of their community and allow the program to continue growing and reaching more families that are affected by food insecurity and malnutrition. We're also working with translators since we're working in indigenous communities where Spanish isn't the main language. So it's really important to us to get that feedback and input. And one of the key ways that we do that is through home visits and focus groups. So we really bring the program to where women are. And COVID has definitely thrown a wrench in that. There are lockdowns in Guatemala as well, but we've been able to call the women in our programs. They're sending us pictures on WhatsApp of their farms, which has allowed us to keep up to date with them and give them advice on things that they can do. And then the last class, which is of course the most fun and most delicious is our cooking class. So we go over how to produce the mealworm powder and then make a recipe that's common to the area of Guatemala where we're working. And while our focus at Mealflower is Guatemala, that's where we have strong implementation partners, that's where we know the context, we do believe that there is a huge potential to scale this globally. And we've already been partnering and collaborating with organizations in Uganda and Zambia and Madagascar to bring this idea of edible insects addressing food insecurity to more communities. And so you can see that our training materials have made it all the way to Uganda, where our handouts were used to explain the mealworm life cycle. And it's really critical that we scale this worldwide. There's food insecurity in all of the countries that we saw earlier, both in urban and rural areas. 
And I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, point out one of our key partners in these efforts, which is Mighty, the mission to improve global health through insects. And they've really been key in identifying some of the next steps, which is where I'm hoping some of you can get involved in the future of food. So our partner, Valerie Stull at Mighty, is already leading a lot of the research around edible insects and their health and nutritional impacts. But we do also need more research on the best farm models and how we can adapt it to different materials and climates. Which brings us to the second point in terms of things that we need. We need more programs in diverse areas. If this is going to be a global solution, we need to start testing and collecting data on how programs like meal flour work in different areas. And as all of this is happening, we need to maintain the focus on local farms. We really need to empower the communities and families that are suffering from food insecurity to produce their own source of nutrition. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Gabrielle, for that really interesting presentation. I'm, I'm eager to try some of that meal flour in a, in a meal one day. Um, I'm Carolyn Colley, and I'm president of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. You know, at the foundation, our mission is to educate the public on how business does well, does good, and prepares for the future. And certainly the times that we're living in now have ratcheted all of those things up. And it is really our privilege and an obligation that we feel to bring in leaders from different sectors and different industries, all grappling with the path forward and how we'll come out on the other side. So we're looking for their insights and their experiences. And it's just a real treat today to welcome Blue Apron CEO, Linda Findley Kozlowski. Welcome, Linda. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Linda, um, prior to joining Blue Apron, just, um, you know, a few at the end of last year, a little bit before the pandemic, she had been the COO at Etsy and she had been a director at, um, at Alibaba. And of course, coming just in the nick of time to, to manage a big impact on the company. Um, but she's been widely credited for leading Blue, Blue Apron. Um, through really unprecedented growth in this remarkable time. So, um, Linda, we've got a ton of questions for you, but let me start with this one. Um, if you can set the table, if you will. Um, tell us, uh, just to kind of get our heads on straight, tell us about the, the meal kit industry. I think everyone knows that Blue Apron, it, you know, is a leader in that, but it's relatively new in the last, you know, 10 or 15 years. But talk to us about how it got here and um, what your typical customer was, at least in the early days. Yeah, so it, it did start originally in Europe and uh, Blue Apron was the first meal kit company in the United States. We, we launched in 2012. And really the impetus behind the launch of Blue Apron was um, driving healthier eating because, you know, with, with meal kits, you were able to prepare fresh Are already going down that path of not being as healthy because they weren't eating a lot of fresh vegetables and um, and fresh foods, and so this was really born out of that necessity. Um, but it does really provide a lot of benefits when it comes to reducing overall food waste, uh, being able to portion control, being able to try new and interesting recipes and new and interesting things, remove the fatigue of planning um, and thinking about what's for dinner tonight. new things. Well, I have a, a bunch of questions I'd like to ask you about sustainability, and we'll get to that in a couple of minutes. But um, can, tell us about what it was like when you were sitting in your CEO's office and, you know, word began to come and, the, you know, end of February, middle of March about this pandemic coming. How did you kind of get your leadership together? What were some of the what was the decision making like and, and the speed of things for you at that point? Well, when we first started hearing what was happening, we actually weren't seeing 
that much from consumers at that point. I think everyone still had a lot of questions mid-February. And it was really more about how do we make sure we're prepared? And one of our top concerns is always safety and sanitation. We are a food facility. We are regulated by the FDA. We are SQF certified, which is one of the highest standards in the world. So we're already very, very concerned with making sure that our sanitation, our food safety standards and everything are in place. So the very first thing that we did was we looked at those standards, we looked at the guidelines um, from the CDC. We're like, okay, what should we be doing now to make sure that our consumers stay safe and that our employees stay safe? And anything that comes forward, we can be prepared for when it comes to a safety um, standard. So that was actually our first priority. And it was just, how do we keep employees and, and customers safe? The, the interesting thing about it is because of the high standards we have in our fulfillment centers, we only needed to add a little bit more as far as safety and sanitation procedures, social distancing, et cetera, because of the fact that we were already in full um, PPE, we already had significant regular cleanings in place. So it was mainly just making those adjustments that would be very specific to COVID um, mm -hmm. so that we were um, avoiding as much risk as possible there. How lucky you were to have so many of those stringent things um, in place already. How many fulfillment facilities do you have and how many employees did you need to take care of through this? So, you know, we have roughly 1600 employees and we have two main fulfillment centers, one in California and one in, um, in New Jersey. And uh, we did also have a fulfillment center in, in Texas at the time, which we were in the process of winding down to um, move the volume to the two other uh, facilities for efficiency and also, frankly, for traceability and some other reasons. So, um, so we were in the process of making that transition, but it's about 1600 employees and we focus a lot on how do we make sure that they understand not only how to be safe within the facility, but also, of course, outside of the facility so that they have the tools they need to keep them and them, their family safe. Give me a, a snapshot of what it looks like in these facilities. I mean, I, I've received Blue Apron before, so I'm imagining a box, right? Is it, what does it look like pulling ingredients together? Is that, is that something you even do as the CEO? <laughs> it is actually, I think one of the most important ways to really understand how to improve the customer experience is to make sure that you're working on every aspect of it. So I do um, every so often work full shifts on the pack line and make sure that I understand everything that our employees are, are managing through in the process of day-to-day -day, um, assembling the boxes and, and making sure that the ingredients there, making sure that everything is fresh. So really within the fulfillment center, we sort of have two parts to our fulfillment. We have what we call the kitchen operations, which is where kind of some of the magic happens. That's where we put together all the unique sauces and the unique spices that we're able to put in our knickknack bags to give the unique flavor of Blue Apron recipe. That's it, you know, as I was looking at um, at the menus of the week, I, you know, my mouth started to water. Um, but I wonder if you can talk for a minute about um, customer tastes, literally have customer tastes changed? Have people been more interested in being more healthy? Are they more interested in comfort food during this period? But how have your menus adjusted to demand? I think we might have had uh, a quick drop here. I'll wait for our tech team to uh, to let me know. Um, Linda, if you can hear me, I'll, I'll just carry on with that question. I was wondering about um, how consumer tastes and menu choices have changed. I know that when I looked at the website, um, you know, as an aficionado of the grilled cheese sandwich, I thought that the mango grilled cheese sandwich looked fantastic. I would order that. There were Korean burgers, but I wonder, um, you know, in what directions have people been, you know, changing their orders? What are they looking for these days? Actually, the interesting thing is there's the dynamic of, of tastes in some ways hasn't changed that much. So early on, we didn't see that many changes in people's tastes. 
Then we saw a big, much bigger desire for comfort foods. We went through a real comfort food phase where everybody was looking for pastas, what have you. Although to be honest, we tend to see that phase on a fairly regular basis. But what was interesting is as we moved into summer as usual, we saw a lot more interest in health and lighter options, options that could be grilled. Um, so honestly, it followed a lot of the same pattern, but we, we definitely have a lot of people that are craving a few of those comfort um, comfort items like pastas and burgers and things like that that we're, we're known for making incredibly well. Um, enchiladas are some of our best uh, recipes and those have been flying off of the uh, shelf, if you will. <laughs> I bet meatloaf too. Yeah. Um, you know, over the past five months or so, the Chamber Foundation has been hosting a weekly online interview series about the path forward for returning to work. And we've had experts from, you know, ventilation experts to public health officials and people really focused on how to get back to work safely. One of the biggest takeaways from, you know, we had con consumer researchers and, and people, you know, business consultants from McKinsey, one of the biggest takeaways was um, the confidence that needs to return in consumers. And you talked a little bit about showing safety and procedures at your facilities, but what are some of the other ways that you might've um, changed your communication with customers, with your subscribers? So I think it's, it's very important that we made sure we were really clear with everyone exactly what we were doing around COVID safety and sanitation. And so we focused on that first. Then we started talking a lot about our supply chain. The reality is that when um, you think about what we do, we really use technology to understand exactly how much food is needed um, in order to fulfill customer needs for each week. So we order just as much as we need. Um, and then we put that into the box and it's only as much as the customer needs. So that's really a big part of reducing food waste, but there's additional benefits beyond just food waste reduction, which includes um, because 70% of what we source comes directly from the producers, that food is actually touching fewer hands between um, the, the, the time it's produced and the time it actually reaches you. Um, and it's in a very controlled environment throughout the process. So that part is incredibly important. And again, even though there was no evidence of any uh, transfer of COVID through food, we always wanted to be super cautious about making sure people understood that transparency all the way back to the supply chain, particularly because, you know, Blue Apron is known for having very high animal welfare standards, very high produce standards. And so the, our supply chains, when there was a bunch of disruption within particularly the protein supply chains, we didn't see as much because we tend to be sourcing from a higher quality, more restaurant level um, uh, sort of fulfillment chain than necessarily a mass one. And so it was important that people understood where the meat was coming from and how it was being handled in the process as well. So those are some of the things that we did to continue to make sure people understood exactly the origins of everything that they were putting into the box. Because for us, it, it matters because we know that what you put in your body is one of the most intimate things you do in a day. And particularly if you're actually preparing food for your family, you want to make sure that you know exactly where that food is from and how it's been treated. Well, that kind of clear and, and consistent communication is so important. So, so bravo for being on the leading front of that. I want to switch gears for a second and go back to something you've mentioned um, a couple of times, which is your priority on sustainability and shrinking food waste and just cleaning up that whole system. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, how else you manage that chain, how you focus on sustainable, um, growing sustainable, helping sustainable producers that you work with? What, why is all of that important to you? Hi, sorry. Do you have me back now? We're back. <laughs> so I'm sorry. I'm not sure why I just lost internet again. Um, but uh, I think if I understood your question, it was about the sustainability and food waste aspect of what we're doing. Right. Um, and really, it's, it's sort of focused on two different areas. One is how do we make sure that we're reducing food, food waste in the supply chain? You know, 30 to 40% of 
of what uh, comes into the supply chain in the, in the United States is actually thrown out. And so we wanna make sure we're reducing on both ends. And then we're also a leader when it comes to recycling and more than 80% of our packages uh, recyclable. Um, we're a participant in the How to Recycle program and we're the first ones to participate in that to make sure people knew exactly what to do. And so those two things in combination, we feel very proud of the fact that um, using our meal kit represents, uh, and this is according to a University of Michigan study, a third lower carbon footprint than going to the grocery store for the same thing, primarily because of the food waste process. At the same time, we're able to do this while maintaining very high animal welfare standards and in very high produce um, quality standards. So we also feel like we're giving you the best ingredients and we continue to try to evolve that um, sanitation and, um, and, and the uh, environmental footprint aspect of what we're doing to make sure that we're, we're really just always on the leading edge. You know, it's really inspiring to talk to leaders like you who are really implementing these things throughout the business. I think you've done such a great job of talking to your consumers and, and working so well with your employees and your customers. So thank you so much for being with us today. I hope that you'll come back, um, you know, in a new menu and a new season and yeah. hopefully more growth for Blue Apron. Um, so thank you for growing. Thank you for keeping people back at work. That's something we really care about here at the Chamber of Commerce and the foundation. And um, so, you know, good luck to you and we hope you'll come back. Thanks so much. And thank you for all of the work you do as well on that front. It's so important and I so appreciate being here. Great. Thank you, Linda. Bye-bye. Yeah, Bye-bye. Well, thanks so much. Uh, it was a great conversation with, with Linda, I thought, um, as, a, as a leader in sort of the food system of the future. And, and we're I'm delighted to be joined by Tessa, Ben, and Seth today to talk about sort of feeding a changing world. Um, I would love for you all to introduce yourself briefly and then uh, start off with this question of sort of that I think Linda, the conversation with Linda really sort of inspired for me, which is really around, um, you know, what has been the impact of COVID on your business and on consumer behavior, in your view? Maybe Tessa, I'll start with you and then Seth and then Ben. Great. Hi, everybody. I'm Tessa. I'm co founder and CEO of Olio. Olio is the world's first neighbor to neighbor food sharing app. So, what we do is we tackle the problem of food waste specifically in the home, which in a country like the US and UK accounts for approximately half of all food waste. And we do that by connecting people with their neighbors so they can give away their spare food rather than throw it away. And we also have about 10,000 volunteers who collect and redistribute unsold food from supermarkets, cafes, etc. So with regards to the question about COVID, we have seen some dramatic changes in consumer behavior. And to be perfectly honest, uh, what would have taken 10 years of campaigning around raising consumer awareness of the problem of food waste has uh, taken place effectively in the first 10 days of lockdown. So here in the UK, research came out fairly quickly that showed that over half of people said that they are now valuing food more as a result of COVID. And I think you only need to see a few photographs of empty supermarket shelves for it to really hit home that food is precious, it's our life source. And we've also seen that 48% of people are wasting food less. Now, sadly, as lockdown restrictions have started to ease here in the UK, the amount of food that's been wasted in the home is slowly edging back up again. But thankfully, it's nowhere near the levels that it was at pre-COVID. And I very much hope that we're sort of on a new normal where people are recognising the importance of food rather than throwing it away. Yes, yeah, so, so I'm Seth Crawford, Vice President of Fuse Connected Services and Digital Customer Experience for Agco Corporation. Agco Corporation manufactures and distributes agricultural equipment around the world, uh, including the products that you know as tractors, grain harvesting combines. Uh, we also manufacture and distribute uh, grain storage and uh, then uh, animal livestock buildings and, and the, the required uh, materials for that. As far as where we were impacted when, when COVID came on, <clears throat> first of all, it hit right as most of the Northern Hemisphere 
uh, was having the crops planted in the fields. So the farmers around the world uh, in, the, in the northern part of the uh, world were right in the middle of planting crops, trying to get that seed in the ground and trying to do what they do. And uh, the farmers and our business were deemed an essential industry. And so we kept up and running, but it didn't mean that that uh, meant that the supply chains weren't uh, disrupted. And so it caused some factory shutdowns. And as Tessa mentioned, we, we saw a lot of empty store shelves, but that doesn't mean the farmers stopped producing. It was just the supply chain disruption. But uh, like the farmers that I mentioned uh, are super resilient in how they went about their business, it caused us to be resilient as well. And so we very quickly adapted to provide a remote service, remote support. Uh, we were quick to get our factories uh, to the point where we felt safe uh, to get our, our employees back to work and producing the products and, and supporting our customers. Because without that, we, we would have uh, major problems from a food standpoint. And so uh, we feel quite good about how we've come through it. And now it's opened up many new opportunities that, that have uh, advanced during that time. So that's that's what, what Echo has been up to. Great. Uh, yeah, I'm Ben Chesler. Uh, I'm a co-founder uh, and a board member, uh, former chief innovation officer of Imperfect Foods. Um, we are the largest online mission-driven grocery store in the US. Uh, so we basically take the produce and groceries uh, that would normally go to waste, uh, the over 6 billion pounds that would normally go to waste in the fields, in facilities, uh, manufacturers, distributors, uh, and instead deliver that to your door for about 30% less in the grocery store. So it's basically online shopping every week. You pick what you want, uh, but items that are affordable and that you can feel good about um, because uh, they help with sustainability because they would have gone to waste. So I would say that um, with the pandemic, we saw two big effects. So one was um, temporary uh, disruptions in the supply chain. So a story I really love is that um, Imperfect was able to buy like 40,000 snack trays from JetBlue uh, that would have gone to waste because they were planned for plane. And obviously when air travel kind of stopped immediately, they had no idea idea what to do with this food that was destined for air travel. And so we were able to sell those snack trays to our customers at a great discount. And it was, I think the, 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 it was a great story about um, saving food and uh, giving it to our customers. So we really are set up to deal with that flexibility of sourcing on a weekly basis. And so we were able to really help a lot of manufacturers that were meant for restaurants, the entertainment industry, um, deal with food that would have gotten to waste and get it to the consumer market. Um, and the second thing I agree with Tessa is that um, in the first 10 days, we saw more uh, adoption of online grocery than we have in the last 10 years. I think typically about two to 4% of uh, grocery purchases are made online. And they just have the research now that 80% of people in the US uh, tried online grocery at least once during the pandemic. Um, and so you are seeing customers start to get comfortable because they have to for safety reasons um, with online shopping. And I think they're starting to say, hey, maybe I'm not going to be going back to the store because it's really nice to be able to shop online. And ben, just sticking with you around um, you th that picking up on that theme of sort of acceleration of the online grocery shopping experience, you know, I, I wonder what you think about the first order, second order, third order consequences of that, because typically, in my experience, you know, as an investor in the food system, you have a lot of siloed thinking, right? Like production ag doesn't talk to grocery as as much as you would think that they do. There's a lot of silos that are happening. One of the things that we think about is does, does channel digitalization, i.e., online grocery, create a little bit you know, supply chains that perhaps where there's less siloed and more sort of, you know, interconnectedness and, and sort of, I'm uh, just curious to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, we, we there's kind of two forms of online, right? So there's been like Instacart, where you're just basically pulling from a grocery store. And so they're using somewhat of the same supply chain. Um, but I think, um, and we heard from Linda Blue Apron before a little bit, um, when you have a pure online play like we do and you operate your own facilities, um, 
one, you're able to react a lot more quickly because you're buying straight from the manufacturer. And two, you're able to have a little bit more of that direct relationship with the manufacturer, with the producer, with the farmer um, to do planning. Uh, I would say the biggest advantage we really had uh, that I kind of touched on is that we already work with our, our farmers on a weekly basis. We don't have, you know, season long contracts for the most part. And so we're able to react when they have overages or shortages, which I think is, is, is really helpful uh, for them. Ben, I mean, you, you deal about production ag. I mean, do you see that your relationship changing and the role of digitalization changing in terms of more of the downstream or impacts affecting, you know, it's where you all play in the value chain? Was that for me, Sanjeev? Yeah, sorry, for Seth. Okay. Yeah. All right, <laughs> no problem. I thought you said Ben there for a second, so. Um, well, absolutely. What what I what we have found is, you know, going into the 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 COVID crisis, what what we saw was a little bit of reluctance uh, in adopting some technology by farms, uh, and and one of those areas is just connecting their fleet. And we had products that were connected, feeding information back about how they were progressing through the season. Uh, getting their information, being able to help the customer optimize their operation, diagnose their machine, and, and help them overall agronomically. But uh, through this and, and seeing that, you know, it, it's difficult to get people out to their farm and we can help them overall with their, their optimization efforts. Now we have customers really pulling uh, for this uh, as far as the connectivity. And I think that's only going to help us long term because if you really want to understand what's going on in the complete value chain, uh, seeing how the, the season is progressing. You know, the USDA puts out reports uh, on a weekly basis about the crop uh, and, and how it's progressing. And there's a lot of scouting and a lot of information that goes on with that. But now with the connected fleet that's out there, we really can watch that. And not just in, in the United States, but really around the world. And that changes the game from an information standpoint because it's real time. It's highly accurate. You can really see how things are coming along. And I think that's going to help us all the way through. And as we're, we learn how to ingest all that information and appropriately share that information, uh, we can also tackle some of the food waste issues that I know we're all interested in. It's a good topic to bring Tessa into the conversation <laughs> around food waste. I mean, you, there's a lot of individual action and individual responsibility, but there's some systems issues. And maybe talk about sort of what you see as system issues and potentially things that you know are favorable to tackling some of those system issues as a result of, of the pandemic and perhaps some behavior change that could occur. Yeah, so when we look at food waste, I think it's really understand to break down the value chain and understand where exactly it takes place. So this is UK data, but the US and, and other sort of uh, Western European countries aren't dissimilar. So half of all food waste takes place in the home. And I think that is the point that to date has been broadly missed in much conversation around food waste. And I've kind of discussed some of the behavioral changes that are starting to take place there. 2% of all food waste takes place at a retail store level. 8% takes place in hospitality and leisure. 12% in manu manufacturing. And then about 28% takes place uh, at the farm gate. And what COVID has done is really <coughs> challenge the issue of food waste throughout the supply chain. And uh, in particular here in the UK, for example, it was news that was just announced this morning. The government has been holding talks with 200 of the UK's largest food retailers and food manufacturers and producers around introducing mandatory food waste reporting through the supply chain. And that is a conversation that's been, or, or a topic that has been discussed for many, many years, but has never had any real momentum. But since COVID, COVID has really highlight, highlighted for people the insanity that we have such enormous levels of food waste, roughly a third of all the food we produce, coexisting alongside widespread hunger. So um, I know in, in the US, for example, I think another 10 million, it's gone from 40 million to 50 million people are now living in food poverty as a result of the COVID crisis. And so there's going to be pressure uh, and renewed effort to solve the problem at every single step of the supply chain. And what we're also seeing is digitization 
and the use of technology throughout the supply chain to try and tackle the food waste problem. But also we've seen, um, certainly here in the UK, growing disintermediation. So, for example, more businesses are now connecting, even sort of at a farmer level, directly with their end consumer because COVID has given them the impetus to actually digitize, to actually get online. That has then enabled them to connect directly with the end consumer in a way that they have never been able to before. And so I think we're seeing some very profound uh, changes are just starting to ripple through the supply chain. What do you like? What do you? I think I think it's a question for 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 Ben and Seth as well. What do you all see as the second order consequences of that in terms of that relationship and that decision mediation? Are there things that you think are non obvious that will occur that will impact consumers and the food system as a result of that? I think I'll quickly go and then hand on to the others I think for me the big thing that we haven't spoken about much yet um, I'm not saying it's non-obvious actually it's, it's incredibly obvious but it's very profound is the increasing localization of our food systems what co you know it's actually remarkable that our food systems did hold up as well as they did but for many people there was there's just not nearly enough resilience in our food systems. It's too centralized and therefore it's too vulnerable and we're too exposed to risk. And so again, at every stage of the value chain, everybody's looking to build more resilience into our systems. And that almost inevitably is involving greater localization. And I think customers want to reconnect. I think COVID has um, really, awoken in people their desire for some very sort of human things which is about valuing the importance of food and also connecting with their local community and people want to support and build a relationship with their local suppliers which not only gives them security during a situation such as this but also they know that provenance and they have that relationship um, with regards to where the foods come from is that the best? Is that the you go? go ahead yeah go ahead Ben. First, so. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, I'll go ahead. Um, yeah. I mean, I think when we talk about kind of the, you know, the food system, I think there's two points made to test on one of them, which is that I think our food system was meant to be efficient, um, but not quite as resilient. And so I think we're starting to think about that as we, with climate change um, and uh, the pandemic, we're starting to think about can we make it more uh, resilient, not just more efficient, because it was meant, you know, we know exactly how much food people are eating. And we're going to pack exactly that much in the truck and grow exactly that much and realizing that there might be more volatility and we're going to have to be able to deal with that. Um, but I think if we can do anything to reduce food waste, and it's always a thing that's hard to hear um, for consumers from a systemic um, perspective, is that we're taught that you can have anything you want whenever you want it. And it's going to look perfect, right? You know, even if it's the middle of winter, I want a peach and it's going to look exactly orange. And it's going to be exactly round. Um, and if we're able to have a little bit more flexibility, um, we're going to be able to reduce food waste because, uh, as sure as Seth can attest to, despite the fact that we're getting better and better and better um, at technology for agriculture, um, Mother Nature still has a way of uh, getting her way no matter what happens. And so if we can make consumers more flexible, which is this week it might be a green apple, and next week it's a red apple, and the potatoes are going to be a little bit ugly, um, that we're able to uh, return value to the customer and reduce uh, food waste a along the way. Yeah, absolutely. Ben. We, we often refer to farming as being a factory without a roof and, and factories without roofs are, are uh, uh, at the risk of Mother Nature. But, you know, as, as we walk through 2020, to, to us, it's just further uh, underlined the importance of sustainability and food security. Uh, the, the other aspect is digital solutions play a big part already and they're going to play an even bigger part. You know, in, in production agriculture, we've been automating machines for 20 plus years. So it's it's not new while uh, self-driving cars get a lot of the, the press in, in the farm fields around the world. That's been automated to a to a high degree for many years. And, and so what we're really focused on there is, you know, with our agriculture foundation at Agco, we have a zero hunger vision uh, that we've started because we believe that, that we need to continue on this path of, of food security and sustainable agriculture development for the marginalized uh, farming areas of the world. Because the, the other piece is, you know, many of us went to the, the nice supermarkets right around the corner 
did find some empty shelves, but those that are at the highest risk, they, they, they're, they're in much worse shape. Um, and, and that's what we're also focused on. And I think that amplified the, the issues that we really have in, in the disparities around the world. Thank you, Seth. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Tessa. It was a great conversation. I, I come away with some of the themes around disintermediation and flexibility and security as, as positive that, that we can build a better system that's both efficient and sustainable and that also helps sort of the, the most disenfranchised in our society. So thanks for all the work you all do every day to make the system better. Um, and, and, you know, thanks for a great conversation this, today. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, take care. Before you change your mind. Hi there, my name is Fernando Machado and I am the global CMO for Restaurant Brands International. We have three brands uh, here at Restaurant Brands International. We have Burger King, which is the largest brand we have, uh, and we have Popeyes uh, and Tim Hortons. Tim Hortons is a very strong brand in Canada. Uh, it's a cough baked goods brand in Canada. Also present in the US and internationally, but it's a powerhouse uh, uh, in Canada. So today I'm here to talk uh, a little bit about how we are making our brands future proof. Um, I mean, if you think about, if when I think about the biggest challenges, I think that um, that CMOs have today, uh, one of them uh, is to find the right balance between short term and long term. Uh, we we talk a lot short term uh, uh, on the day to day. I think that everyone uh, in an organization uh, needs to be driving short term results. That's basic, right? I mean, I don't think a CMO uh, would survive. 12, 18 months on the job if the results are not there. So short term is definitely uh, something important. But we also need to think about the things that we should be doing today so that our brands are still relevant five, 10 years uh, from now. You know, like uh, building uh, short term sales is our duty, but building the brand uh, for the long term is our legacy. So uh, here at Restaurant Brands International, uh, we created a, a framework for that. Right. I mean, um, when, if, when I think about the vision uh, that we have as a company, uh, uh, which we call like the big dream, our big dream is uh, to have the most loved brands uh, in the in the restaurant industry uh, in the world. So if you want to have uh, the most loved brands, you cannot be just doing the short term, you know, like we need to be investing uh, for these brands to, to, to be strong uh, uh, in the future in the framework uh, that we created. Uh, to, to help us organize ourselves uh, and, and to focus on the uh, on the right things is called restaurant brands for good. Uh, and and the, the meaning uh, behind restaurant brands for good is uh, is the is comes from the belief uh, that the delicious, affordable, and convenient meals uh, that you love should also be sustainable. Uh, so we have three pillars uh, on our restaurant brands for good framework. One pillar has to do with the food. Right, I mean, uh, all the work that we do to improve uh, food quality, and I will talk a little bit about that. Then the second pillar uh, has to do uh, with environmental sustainability, which is like the planet. And the third pillar uh, has to do uh, with people and communities. I'm not going to talk a lot about the third pillar today. I'll be focusing more uh, on the food uh, and planet pillars. Uh, on the people and communities pillar, we do all our work around diversity and inclusion, uh, the work around the 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 foundations that each of our brands have, uh, we, we have foundations that provide support to people and communities, all the work that you do around our crew and, uh, and our people internally. It's not the main point on the presentation, but if you want to know more, you can go to our website, rbi.com slash sustainability, and there will be a lot of information there. So in terms of food uh, and planet, so let me talk first about the, uh, the food pillar. 
food is what we sell. So we are constantly investing to improve the quality of our food. It's not always easy to do that. You know what I mean? Like, uh, especially when it comes to serving real ingredients. Uh, if you think about fast food, people who come uh, to eat at Burger King, uh, we do have salads, we do have grilled chicken, we have all that. But normally when people come, they're looking for a more indulgent uh, type, of, uh, type of meal. Uh, but even if it's indulgent, they want something that's real. You know, they don't want something that's loaded with artificial ingredients uh, or that has a lot of MSG uh, or that has high fructose corn syrup. Like people are looking for real food. So for the past, I would say, five, six years, we've been on a journey to clean up uh, our food. And when I say clean up, it's basically like removing colors, flavors, and preserving some artificial sources, removing MSG, removing high fructose corn syrup, removing anything that detracts from realness. Uh, and we've been doing that globally, yeah? Here in the U.S., uh, our portfolio is around today 85% clean. That's how we, we say. Uh, and soon enough, we'll have 100% clean. We launched uh, uh, this year a Whopper that is 100% clean. So no fillers, no preservatives from artificial sources, no colors of fillers from artificial sources, no MSG, no have to consider. It's the real thing. Um, and, and it's not easy to do that. You know, there are cost implications uh, to doing that. Sometimes when you change one ingredient, there is a, 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 an impact on taste. Um, it, uh, uh, it becomes more difficult uh, in terms of the logistics, supply chain and operations, uh, like uh, the shelf life diminishes, like uh, you have to refrigerate some stuff that before you could just keep at room temperature. What's the important thing to do? And because uh, uh, we are Burger King, right? I mean, because we first did that with Burger King. We also do in Popeyes and Tim Hortons, but uh, when we announced the Whopper, we really wanted to create an impact out there uh, and make people notice what you're doing so we can capitalize uh, uh, on that. So we came up with a groundbreaking campaign that was called Moji Whopper, uh, and I will play the case study for you so that you can take a look at that. Fast food, an industry that offers convenient, craveable food at a good value. But uh, you put out a bag and you could keep it there forever, right? It's right here. No fungus, no mold, no smell. Why is there no mold on that? Well, because of all the stuff we put in our food. What we put in our bodies. It's time to change that. What a difference a day made. Burger King is rethinking the image of its signature Whopper burger. They're turning a lot of heads with a new ad, and maybe some stomachs too. Showing that mold, mold, mold can be a beautiful thing. It shows a moldy Whopper as a way to announce that the fast food chain will no longer put preservatives in their food. The beauty of no artificial preservatives. I think it's great. It's very risky. But I think it's a really neat commercial. It's fascinating and gross at the same yeah. time. When I watch this, I'm like, I can't unsee this. But also, <laughs> I can't stop watching it. When one company makes a decision like this, it certainly have ripples effects across the whole industry. So is this really the best way to sell a burger? Well, I know the difference in you. Look, they're taking out preservatives. This is the real deal. I think it really speaks to the fact that companies are hearing this huge tectonic shift of customers asking real questions about what's in their food. They're removing preservatives because they feel real food tastes better. The difference is you. So really cool campaign, shocking, uh, but like that's what we need as a brand, you know, like to shake people out of their comfort zone and show them uh, some of the amazing things we're doing. So that's, I think, is a great example uh, of like how to uh, improve food quality. We've been doing more things, like uh, we became uh, global leaders in plant-based burgers. In the U.S., we have a partnership uh, with Impossible Foods. And for the past year and a half, we have been offering like the Impossible Whopper uh, in our restaurants. That has been a huge success. Uh, we also have a partnership with Unilever in Europe. 
our own plant-based burgers. We have partnerships with different suppliers across the globe, our own plant-based burgers. We have plant-based burgers in more than 35 uh, countries uh, at the moment, and they will continue to grow. But I don't have time to talk about that. So I'll flip to the next pillar, uh, which is the uh, planet pillar. So in terms of planet, uh, we do a lot of work making our packaging more uh, environmentally friendly, making our restaurants more environmentally friendly, not just the materials, but also the processes inside of the restaurant. Uh, we do a lot of work in terms of traceability of ingredients, uh, uh, in terms of like uh, asking our suppliers to do the right thing and making them commit to that. Uh, there are many examples that I could showcase here. I, I hope I can I have time to show two uh, examples for you. One is uh, Project Meltdown. Uh, Project Meltdown uh, is part of our commitment to uh, uh, remove all non-biodegradable plastic toys from our system by 2025. And believe me, we do have a lot of plastic toys in our system. Uh, it's funny that um, uh, in terms of number of toys, we are probably like the number two uh, toy manufacturer, not manufacturer because like uh, we just, we sell, but uh, we are number two in the world in terms of, of toys. Uh, so the volumes that you command are very, very high. And I have a five-year-old uh, and I also have a nine-month-old, but like my five-year-old, when he gets uh, one of those plastic toys, He's very excited about it for like two minutes and then it, he throws it away, you know, and that becomes single use plastic. So we committed to ban non biodegradable plastic toys by 2025, but we already started to remove them now. Uh, the UK is one of our most important markets uh, globally. Uh, it's a market that has a, a strong component of uh, party with kids, which is where the, the, the kids meal um, uh, belongs. Uh, and on UK, we already remove uh, all plastic, number of the little plastic twice, and uh, and that was part of Project Meltdown. I will show a very short video uh, to you. Mm. Wait, did that just say? That was Project Meltdown. Uh, another good example that, uh, that I would like to share uh, is a project that we call it Cow's Menu. Uh, we noticed that there were some scientists working uh, on, on developing like a, a natural uh, feed additive to add to the diet of cattle uh, to help reduce methane emissions. Um, if, you, if you're not aware of that, uh, uh, cattle uh, tends to uh, produce a, considerable amount of methane emissions uh, during the digestion uh, and, and the burps of the cow, the, the cattle, I know it sounds, sounds funny, but the burps, it, it's mostly burps, but a little bit of fart, but mostly burps uh, uh, produce uh, um, methane uh, and, and, uh, and that's not good for the environment. So uh, we, uh, we partnered with a group of scientists in Mexico first that was developing and working on this and, and we evaluated different types of additives, all natural, uh, and uh, after doing a lot of research, we found that uh, adding 100 grams of lemongrass uh, to the cattle diet can reduce on up to 33% of the methane emissions. We are doing more research around that. We also partner with UC Davis here in the US. We, ha we have a partnership for university in Europe. We are replicating the tests in Brazil because cattle can be different and the feed can be different to make sure that uh, we can expand that and continue to work with our partners and farmers uh, who also have other ways to reduce methane. There is a lot of work going on uh, on this area. So this is one of those projects that we are like on the leading edge, like a, really like a scientific development. We published a, a paper uh, which was peer reviewed around the topic. So I'll just show a little bit of the, I, I don't have time to show entirely, but if you go on YouTube and search Cow's Menu, Burger King, you'll see this. Uh, but I'll show a little bit of the clip uh, that we created to make this uh, consumer facing uh, to people. 
So just to wrap it up, I think that if I were to leave you with one message, my message would be uh, that uh, as, a, as a marketeer or as like a leadership uh, on your company, you always need to be thinking about the short term and the long term. Uh, and when it comes to long term, uh, I think it's very hard to argue that investing on improving product quality, whatever product we, you have, and investing behind environmental sustainability uh, will help you guarantee a, a better future for, uh, for your brand and for your company. In our case, we created a framework for that. And I think that helps because tackling these things can become really complex and, 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 and you end up like losing sight or uh, what's priority and having a framework can really help you uh, on that. Uh, and then do the work first. Uh, I, I always say action, not ads. You know, like I think that we all have to do the work first and then we can capitalize potentially on this work by communicating. But it's really important that you do the work, improve the quality of our products, whatever that means to your category and to your brand, uh, improve your environmental footprint, and hopefully also make sure that your brand and your company are doing good uh, for people and communities. I haven't touched a lot on that, but that's also one of the pillars of our Restaurant Brands for Good framework. I hope this helped you uh, uh, on your journey. Uh, I'm always on Twitter, so feel free to, uh, to reach out, find me there, ask me questions. I'm always happy to, uh, to engage. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. No, I'm sorry. I'm about to. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, this is Rachel Conrad. I'm the chief communications officer at Impossible Foods, um, is a food company based in California's Silicon Valley. I just want to say it's a huge honor to go after Fernando Machado. He's truly one of the best CEOs in the business, and I consider him a real mentor. Um, as you know, um, Impossible Whopper is a big hit, and it's sold in all uh, 7,500 Burger Kings nationwide. So please try it. It'll help you understand the company. And if that's not enough, I'll give you a little bit more of, a, of an insider's view of Impossible. I've been at the company for about four years, and I just wanted to walk you guys through some of what the company has been up to since we, since we launched. Um, so first of all, Impossible Foods is very much a mission-driven company. I think every company says that, but Impossible Foods' goal is truly to make Earth awesome again by transforming the global food system. Our goal is to make a difference on the planet that you can literally see from space. And I'll tell you about how and why we're doing that. Our strategy is to make delicious, nutritious, and sustainable meat, fish, and dairy foods directly from plants bypassing livestock entirely. And the way we're doing that is we're putting our products on the open market so real people can choose for themselves. So the, pro the company started back in 2011. Uh, this is a photo of Pat Brown. He was a very successful Stanford biochemistry professor leading an award-winning laboratory. He was doing cures for cancer and um, helping to decode the human genome. He's the inventor of the DNA microarray. He quit his job back in 2011 to start Impossible Foods because he was concerned that the current system that we use to make uh, meat is not scalable. We've really reached kind of peak, peak ability to produce meat using the really old fashioned method of, of livestock. So he literally built a team that was responsible for reverse engineering at the molecular level, um, how and why meat 
tastes and performs the way it does. And then um, reverse engineering that to use make the same product that delivers the same amount of deliciousness, nutrition, and, um, you know, versatility, but without using animals. Um, let me tell you about why that's so important. So humans, as everybody here knows, have had a very long relationship with meat. Um, we've literally been eating it uh, since about the time we invented fire. Um, when you look at cave drawings in Lascaux, France, um, you know, it's really about our relationship with meat. You know, we were hunters, right? Hunters and gatherers. Um, in the Middle Ages, the second photo picture here, you know, we still had a very one-on-one -on -one relationship with the animals we ate. Um, literally, we just, you know, killed them in our yards or in the castle courtyard um, and consumed them one, one by one. Um, by about the, the 19, you know, 1900 or so, we started to industrialize the process of meat consumption. Um, in, instead of killing our own animals, we started to be able to go to butcher shops. Um, and now we have fully industrialized the process um, you know, to the extent that a lot of people don't even understand where their meat is coming from, how it's made, what the slaughterhouse process looks like, um, you know, and we have done, we have, we have scaled up meat to the maximum possible capacity. We're literally now at a, a point where we're slaughtering 47 pigs per second per day globally. Um, that's actually not sustainable because already um, livestock and their crops consume about 45% of the arable land in the world. We have literally created a planet in which about half of the usable land is dedicated to livestock. Um, and this is land that unfortunately then can no longer be used for native ecosystems, for biodiversity, for native wildlife, native flora and fauna. It also can't be used for photosynthesis um, as, it, as it used to be because we have eliminated a lot of the biodiversity and we've replaced it with cows or you know sheep or pigs or chickens or their feed crops. Um, so Pat's idea back in 2011 was what if there was a better way to do this? What if we could make meat delicious, nutritious, uh, versatile, affordable meat that real meat lovers crave, but without the animal? What if we could make it actually sustainable? What if we could reduce the carbon footprint of meat production to such an extent that we could allow a huge percentage of that 45% of the earth that is now dedicated to livestock, we could return that back to native ecosystems. What if we could do that? So the way to do that is obviously you gotta make meat even better than the current use of animals as the food production technology. You gotta make it just as juicy, delicious, nutritious, but you gotta make it better in that you gotta make it sustainable, which using livestock for meat is just, is just not. So basically, Pat and his team of, of scientists back in 2001 to 2016 um, started to discover why does meat taste the way it does? Why is it so craveable? Why do we humans literally dream about it, think about it all the time? Why does it occupy such a special place in, in our cultures, in our cuisine, in our world? Um, the reason is actually because of something called heme. Heme is a molecule that is essential to life. Um, heme is already ubiquitous in everything you eat. It's already ubiquitous in you. Um, it's the reason why your cheeks are red, your lips are red. It's the reason why your body can absorb oxygen. If you don't have heme, you literally die pretty quickly. Um, heme is found in massive abundance in mammal muscle. Uh, because it's used to carry oxygen. Um, another word for mammal muscle, by the way, is meat. Um, so while heme is found in everything from, you know, broccoli to um, milk to soybeans, it's found in very, very high concentrations in, in meat. It's really the reason why we and other true carnivores, like, you know, cats, really crave, um, crave meat. So we thought, you know, since heme is available and in everything and it's ubiquitous in the world, why don't we take heme from plant sources, which is, you know, biochemically identical to the heme in 
um, meat from animals and use that in a reverse engineered um, version of a burger, you know, this iconic American dish, probably America's uh, number one global export, the burger. If we could do that, we could actually reverse engineer meat from the molecular level up and duplicate everything that consumers love about meat from animals without the animal. So we did that. Um, we, we get heme from the uh, soy plant. Um, again, heme is found everywhere. It's in the plant kingdom, soy actually has quite a bit of heme. Um, this is why when you cut open the roots of, of soy plants, there are pieces of it that are bright red, just like a steak. Um, we also, in our burger, use soy protein, which is grown and milled right here in the U.S. soy belt of Minnesota, Iowa, and Illinois. Um, we use potato protein. We use coconut oil. We use, um, you know, uh, minerals, um, amino acids, a lot of really good stuff. Um, and we get a product that actually rivals the... Um, animal analog, which is ground beef from cows, um, for taste. Um, we've done a ton of studies, about half the people don't even under, don't, don't, don't realize that they're eating Impossible Burger when they're in a very specific blind taste test that we do. Um, and a, a big proportion um, of, of the people actually prefer our burger to the animal analog. Um, so from a taste perspective, we've nailed it. Um, but significantly from a sustainability perspective, we have delivered a vast improvement over, you know, old old meat that, that we as humans have been eating since the time of the invention of fire. Our uh, product, the Impossible Burger, uses 96% less land. That should be obvious because we don't have vast tracts of you know, concentrated animal feeding operations or slaughterhouses. Um, we use 87% less water. This is pretty important because the livestock sector is literally, um, you know, the number one user and polluter of water, uh, freshwater worldwide. Our product also re um, reduces greenhouse gas emissions by 89%. A lot of people worry about what they drive um, as a big uh, factor in determining their personal carbon footprint. But in fact, what you eat is critically important. And it's the easiest thing you can do to change uh, your personal carbon footprint. You know, instead of worrying about, um, you know, getting an electric vehicle, getting solar panels, getting a charging station, you know, you can do that too. And I'm a big fan of that, but actually there's an easier way. You can actually just have meat made from plants instead of meat made from animals. And that alone is going to dramatically shrink your carbon footprint, that of the country, that of the world. Um, the other great thing about Impossible Burger is that while it delivers all of the taste and, um, it, you know, and versatility of ground meat from animals, um, because our product doesn't start with an animal, it has no cholesterol, it has no animal hormones, it has no antibiotics, uh, significantly, it also has no chance of contributing to the next zoonotic pandemic because it doesn't require livestock. You know, and again, I'm just I just want to mention that the, the, the real important thing here is that we've developed a product that tastes great. If we didn't do that, we wouldn't even be able to to play in this in this realm of um, of plant based meat. We wouldn't call it that. It wouldn't be that. Um, instead, we've developed a product that actually satisfies hardcore meat lovers. Um, about more than nine out of 10 of our customers do eat meat from animals. Um, it this shows that it satisfies them. We're displacing meat from animals in the grocery store aisle. About 72 cents of every dollar spent on Impossible Burger is money that is no longer spent in the in the animal meat aisle. Um, and this is a great thing for for the planet and the environment. Like I said, our goal is to make a difference that you can see from space. Um, if we can take these 45% of the Earth's land that is currently being used for livestock and their crops and turn it back 
to native ecosystems, let biodiversity flourish, we actually can make Earth awesome again. And uh, it's been a great pleasure talking to everyone here. If you have any questions, I'm always available, um, rachel.conrad at impossiblefoods.com. Always happy to answer your questions, provide sourcing and citations for everything I've said. And um, I look forward to getting to know everyone here um, better in the, in the years to come. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rachel. That was fascinating. And thanks to all of today's speakers. You've given us a lot to think about. Coronavirus comfort food, tasty mealworms, beautiful mold. Before we close out, let's watch a short video from AARP that shows how they're working with the Delaware Nation of Oklahoma to improve access to healthy food in the tribal community. Nation is a small tribe located in Anadarko, Oklahoma. The grant from AARP has allowed us to purchase raised garden beds that help with people who have physical disabilities, as well as the soil, plants, tools that were needed, and some of our native plants that will help beautify the area. We were also able to purchase a grill that the vegetables can be cooked on or it can be used by the community for picnic time. And uh, benches were purchased as well, as well as signage. People with disabilities will be able to garden because of the elevated structure of the beds. They can move up right up underneath it and use the tools to um, actually move the soil and to transplant or even harvest. I believe this will help uh, seniors and, and children come together because you can both work on it together. Your, your elders have the knowledge. They've been doing this. It's a tremendous opportunity for ARP to work again with our outreach in Native American tribal nations and in communities such as Delaware Nation. And what's so special about this part of Oklahoma, it's really the heart of seven Southwest tribal nations. So not only we're impacting Delaware Nation, but many of the tribal nations in the surrounding area. The vegetables will be used for the administration on aging department, where the cook will be able to take the fresh vegetables and use them for elders uh, for their breakfast and lunch. That's free meals that we offer to the elders from the tribe. They are beyond excited to not only try certain fruits and vegetables that they haven't tried before, but try them fresh. This community garden is very important because as our citizens are aging, we need to be able to incorporate them in community engagement that allows them to get out there and get their hands dirty, but also a way for accessible vegetables. Some of our elders may be on low income, and so providing them fresh vegetables without having to purchase really helps. Thank you for attending Food Forward, and thanks again to AARP for supporting the Fast Forward series. I hope we'll see you tomorrow at Housing Forward. We'll discuss why home ownership is in decline. We'll examine the links between housing and health and economic outcomes. We'll even explore some of the ways companies are using big ideas and 3D printers to make the houses of the future more affordable, more accessible, and more sustainable. If you haven't registered for Housing Forward or Sports Forward, be sure to do so right now at uschamberfoundation.org. We have some great speakers. You won't want to miss it. Thanks again for joining us and have a great day.